please welcome co-founders of Visibility Studio, Joseph Guerra and Sina Sorab. Hey guys. Hey. I'm yes. Joseph Guerra. And I'm Sina Sorab. We're the founders of Visibility. Um, it's an industrial design office here in New York. Um, we want to thank Allison and Emily for having us and everyone at Course 77. And we're going to tell you a bit about our office, how we got started, and how we work. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, um, Joseph and I met in 2008 at RISD in the furniture design program. Um, it was really formative years for us. We were surrounded by a lot of really interesting people and we were learning a lot. Uh, people like Carly and Jamie Wolf on that you'll see later. Um, and as we kind of made our way through those four years, we started to see that uh, our corner of the design world, where our interest really was, was industrial design. So migrating into industrial design, acknowledging that we like furniture design and knowing that we wanted to work together, we um, left school a little bit lost, but knowing we needed to get some real world experience before we, you know, we made our practice happen. So I went to Europe. I worked for some design studios you might know, like Industrial Facility in London and Big Game in Switzerland, and ultimately on to Quirky, which was also here in New York. Um, Sina, meanwhile, was at Beck Britain, an awesome lighting designer, um, kind of learning how to run a small business. He eventually became our design director made awesome contacts here in New York. And meanwhile, we're just sort of moonlighting visibility, nights and weekends, figuring out when to plan our timing and when to make it all happen. So in 2014, it finally made sense for us to go full time. Uh, we had like a handful of projects and a handful of clients. And we just didn't have any more time to work on them at night. And we kind of jumped into it. Our first studio was out of my apartment, as it seems like everyone's is. And uh, we were there for about a year before we moved into our first real studio in Lower Manhattan. Yeah, this is a photo of our first real office. It was super small. Um, we always worked in small spaces. We prioritized the location and proximity to our clients over square footage. Um, we really liked that we're kind of in the middle of Lower Manhattan. People can drop in. Clients can come wherever they want. We can pick up prototypes and kind of create really good friendships and relationships from that proximity. Um, we're still in the same building, um, but we've gotten a little bit bigger now. So what is visibility? Are we a design consultancy? Uh, sort of. Design consultancies are usually very broad in what they do. They require a large infrastructure. Um, they cater to any client need and generally, as a result, lack a sense of authorship. Or are we more of a specialist? Um, you know, these are design firms that may focus on packaging or appliances or medical equipment or contract furniture. I think we're somewhere in the middle. Yeah, we consider ourselves to be general practitioners, which really means that we have a wide umbrella of work, a tangible design identity, and we can collaborate with engineers and manufacturers and fabricators to get a project where it needs to be. Um, so you might ask, how wide is our umbrella of work? Um, these are pretty much everything we've ever designed and gotten produced out of the studio. You know, a variety of forms, different applications. There's you know, electronics, chairs, lighting, um, all under sort of the umbrella of what visibility does. Um, and you, can, you can condense them down to six specific fields. These are other patterns that we've noticed, you know, furniture, electronics, appliances. And we also do retail environments. Over the years, we've been lucky enough to work with a pretty large variety of clients, a lot of them here in New York. Um, you know, these, are, these are companies that are, were really up and coming when they were getting started. We knew some of them when they were two or three people, like Outdoor Voices in a way. Um, you know, even, even Everlane when they were just like 20 people. It, it's kind of crazy to get started when you're all getting started at the same time. Um, and we've also been able to work with producers, people like Matter and Roland Hill who produce our designs. Um, these are the kind of large gambit of clients that we collaborate with. And you know, we've taken press outlets seriously over the years, and th these have been our friends as we were getting started. We realized from a very early stage that you know, if you make work and no one sees it, then it doesn't really matter. So with each project that we launch, we reach out to our you know, carefully curated you know, network of, of press contacts, and it really started to make a difference. In 2014, we were on the cover of Monocle Magazine, kind of surprisingly, we had just gotten started. 
And you know, it was a it was a big deal, and it really gave us uh, you know it was a catalyst for all the things that were to come. You know, things like Forbes 30 and Sight Unseen Design Hot List, um, and you know, our first time in the New York Times were all certain milestones throughout our career. Uh, so now that you know a little bit more about us and how we got started working, um, what we really want to talk about is how a practice like ours works with clients. So, <laughs> so, I'll tell you about it. Um, <laughs> that, those, uh, so working with clients, it's kind of a push and a pull. It's adversarial, but it can also be collaborative. Um, it's a mix of you and it's a mix of them. And uh, Naoto Fukusawa has like a really great analogy for it in that uh, design process is a soup stock and the designers are the ingredients and the client provides the seasoning. Um, I think that's pretty apt. And you're here to serve the client, but you're also here to serve yourself, which is important to never forget. Yeah, more often than not, though, you really just play the client's therapist. Clients come to you with all their wants and needs, you know, everything that has to do with product, but also like their business plan, how they're going to launch, their business model, how it's going to be branded, product requirements, materials, is it portable, is it recyclable? And we have to funnel all of that through what we call our lens. And that lens is what kind of leads to the final product. Um, so our lens, we think that a project needs to be simple, radical, and beautiful. Uh, we believe in simple design, but we also try to balance simple with radical. Um, sometimes you want exciting, passionate things in your life, and at other times you need quieter things. You need a balance, and always with an element of beauty. Um, so these are the different types of relationships that we have with our clients. Clients will approach us. This is pretty typical where you know, someone will come to us, they have an idea, they have a company they want to launch with a, with a product, um, these are companies that work with like uh, Miro and Meeson and um, you know Alter Voices, and you know we'll help them bring that to market, or we'll pitch them. This is more of a phase where we go through internally in the studio. We're we're designing a product, we prototype it, we develop it, and we pitch that product to them in hopes that they'll produce it. Um, or there's sort of like the blank slate carte blanche where us and the client have a great relationship, we know we want to work together, and they kind of let us do whatever we want. Um, so going through like a project that might be like the first one where they come to us, this is our latest product. It's the um, Miro deodorant. Um, it's a refillable deodorant that's better for the environment. They came to us with an interesting brief. Um, in reality, most deodorants aren't recyclable. Everyone throws them away, and they wanted to solve for this problem in collaboration with us. Um, this is a very typical way we work, but you know, we dive into the typology of anything we work with. So in this case of deodorant, we notice that they're all cylinders or bricks, all kind of designed for single use, designed to be thrown away. And getting into the anatomy of how these things are built and how they're engineered. And again, these were all sort of designed and developed just for you to use them, throw them away, and never think about it again. And we were going to have to sort of reinvent that system. Um, always starting off with sketching, variety of forms. Um, form, forms are really important to us, and we take form really seriously. You know, it's about maintaining that familiarity and making something that people want to keep that's exciting. It's something that speaks to deodorant, speaks to the consumer, speaks to use, have a new iconic aesthetic that's desirable, useful, beautiful, and innovative. You know, we were really into model making, 3D printing, you know, paper, this is something you'll probably see if you follow us on Instagram, but we start everything with paper and move that into 3D printing. That physicality is really important to the studio so you can kind of see it and hold it. We knew with a product like this that if we weren't careful, it would probably look like a sex toy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and delving into the engineering a little bit, we really have to design a system that works, and this is one of our initial concepts for how the refillable deodorant pod was going to fit into this thing and come out and how that threaded spindle was going to engage with the elevator inside the device. And this is actually really close to what the engineer ended up implementing. Um, more models getting closer to what the thing was going to look like. Still looks like a penis. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and finally, the fi finished product. Um, 
and the photo shoot that came after. Um, there's the refillable pod um, that you can recycle after it's been used, pops into the plastic hardware, um, you know, tactile dial, each dial lines up with the next dial, kind of like you're winding a watch, and all the colors that come with it. Um, obviously, our clients really care about color, and that's something we try to really in, in engage with them on in finding the right color palette for, for the new brand. Um, and yeah, the, the finished photo. I, another thing I think that's really important to us is while they took these photos, and you know, they're, they're awesome photos, we even afterwards were getting in there and retouching it and changing the colors and making sure this is something that visibility was gonna feel like melded with our aesthetic and something that we could show people and be part of our brand as well. So another project that is interesting for the way that it came together and the way that the client relationship worked is the Champ Stool that we premiered in 2016. Um, and this was a project that was really defined by constraints. So as a project through dialogue, um, what that really means is that we have a close relationship with matter, and because of that, we can be candid, and we can go into a meeting, and you know, that year we were like, what do you guys want to do together? Um, a stackable stool, and then next meeting, oh, it should be efficient materials, and next meeting it should be for the contract market. And as you kind of have these conversations, you start to develop what the project uh, should work like and what it should look like. Um, some early sketches from that project. Uh, I think what's kind of interesting about this, at least unique to the way that we work, is that we really don't do high definition uh, marker renderings that are you know, touched up. Um, if it's not jumping off the page for us at this point, then it's probably not going to work. We quickly always move into physical models. Um, here we're trying some different stacking methods, just getting an idea for the physicality of it. And you know, we're running down to the hardware store to see what we can find to uh, build it in full scale, just to get a sense of it. Um, this is like PVC tube and dowels, but we were able to figure out the way that we wanted it to stack and the general proportions. This photo, it's a very happy photo because that's, our, uh, that's the meeting where we got to test out some real prototypes and see that it does stack the way that we want. All the tolerances are there. Everything was going to work out. And a couple months later, the project came out. Um, so in the end, this is a stacking stool that's uh, lightweight and stacks infinitely in a very small amount of space. Um, this is one of those projects for us that's had a bit of a life of its own. It's wound up in uh, you know, magazines and the woods. Um, <laughs> it's found its way into people's homes, and it's the one that we see around most often, uh, which is a really great experience. Um, and it, finally, it's been kind of extended into a larger family of a counter stool and a bar stool, uh, a table this year, and a soon to come chair. Um, this is a more conceptual project that maybe you guys have seen before, but it's what we did with collaboration with Outdoor Voices. Um, I think what's interesting is this is a conceptual sort of collaboration that actually led to a finished product. Um, this started with Wallpaper Magazine pairing us with Outdoor Voices for a show they do every year at the Milan Salone called Wallpaper Handmade. They wanted us to do kind of an experimental piece of workout equipment. This is actually the first sketch that we did for the Shapes Bundle. It's a series of workout objects. It's like a yoga mat, it's a yoga block, a different type of block. They create kind of different types of challenges, but also will help you with different poses. There's also a wooden muscle roller for really intense knots, I guess. <laughs> Um, and a resistance band. These, this is the finished prototype that, you know, moving from that sketch to this photo shoot, we did that in two weeks, and Sydney was in Japan for part of it. <laughs> um, you know, we had to ship this Milan, we had to get it there, and we had to photograph it. But, you know, it ended up being one of those things that it kind of, again, took a life of its own, but it, you know, was successful both for the brand, Outdoor Voices, but for us. You know, this is the full page spread in um, Wallpaper Magazine, and then they did a photo shoot with Enrique Pirien, a uh, Belgian um, photographer, but moving on to how we would, how this would continue to live, they wanted to ship this. Outdoor Voices wanted to get this to their customers because so many people were asking. So you know, we helped them with the specifications. We we had to fine tune the whole process all over again because moving from a prototype to mass production is obviously really different. Um, we wanted it to be cork. We wanted it to be able to use over and over again. So here you can actually see different amounts of scuffs on different types of finishes on the cork. Um, 
and moving on to the um, finished product. And I, what I like about this project is for us, it was kind of a chance for us to experiment, you know, use different forms, work with a really cool brand, but they also got something out of it where I feel like they didn't even know why they wanted it in the beginning, but it's become this physical object to pair nicely with their clothes, which are often like super two-dimensional, and it's a bit of a, a, a prop and a device for them, I think, to really show the physicality of a, of a brand that needs to be really tangible and tactile. But as many times as it's worked out, it, it doesn't work out sometimes. Um, this is a photo from a factory visit to China that we did last year for a project that since fell through. Um, the client pivoted. Uh, and it's okay when projects fail because you always walk away with something. In this case, we walked away with a large knowledge base that we didn't have before. And things can go sideways on you really fast. Um, the reality is you don't know what's gonna happen when you take a project on. And sometimes it doesn't work out. Uh, so one of the most important things to keep in mind through that process is to always be learning because that's the only thing that you'll walk away with if the project falls through. These are all things that have happened to us. Yeah, I mean, there's another thing that'll happen, and I think it's something <laughs> so I think unique to us is, you know, we turn a lot of work down just on the basis of what the project is. Um, these are just examples of all really bad projects that we've been, you know, approached to do. Um, you know, there comes a certain point where you're doing a CAD model of a clamp designed to go over a mouse, and you're putting air holes into it, and you realize that you might have gone the wrong way on this one. Um, so learning to say no is really important. <laughs> Um, and even when it does work out, there's always challenges. You know, uh, you'll have inexperienced clients who don't really understand the product design process. And it's your responsibility to manage their expectations. Um, it takes a lot of time, effort from a lot of different people and a lot of money to bring a product to market. And people don't know that going into it all the time. And I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with this, but in this sort of startup economy, it's, you know, it's such a fast-paced world with very little regard for the quality of the product or the process. So we really fight for a much slower way of working with a more authentic process that has a lot more research involved and qu quality control, really making sure that you're shipping a product that everyone can be proud of, that visibility can be proud of, and kind of managing those expectations throughout that process. And you'll find that there's, not, there's often a lack of understanding for the value of design and the value that designers can bring to a project. Um, you'll have clients that will think that it's just a sticker that you can stick onto something to charge a little bit more, but uh, you have to educate them and you have to show them that design has to be integrated from the start and design-led thinking uh, ensures a business's success. You know, looking towards the future, we'll end with some, you know, images of our studio and where we work now. Um, I think that we're looking for ways to have a deeper sense of authorship and a deeper involvement with the companies that we work with, almost that of like an in-house design team. So we kind of become their in-house in -house design team because of that relationship we've already forged and their, you know, their understanding of how we work and that we you know, will do a certain type of job and that becomes sort of instrumental to their process. And I think once you have that sort of thing set up, that you get a lot more freedom, um, freedom to design products and freedom to you know, ha be able to develop both the brand and the product and potentially even new businesses. Um, I think the best advice that we can really give is to grow deep relationships with your clients because that gives you the sort of penultimate freedom to design. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>